Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to JAG. My name is Sung Chan Yu, and I'm an associate editor at JAG, as well as an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Systems, Systems Informatics at Yonsei University College of Medicine in Korea. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Hiroki Andrew Uyama from the Division of Cardiology at Emory University Hospital. Uh, today, he will be sharing insights from his upcoming study, which will be presented at the AHA and simultaneously published in JAG. This important work investigates trends and outcomes of PTY12 inhibitor pretreatments in patients with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome in the United States. To start, I'd like to hear a concise summary of the study. Dr. Uyama, could you give us an overview of your research and its key, key focus? Uh, yeah, well, well, first of all, thank you uh, very much for having me here today. It's a great honor. Um, in our study, we investigated the trend, the variability, and clinical outcomes of practice of P2Y12 inhibitor pretreatment in patients with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome in the United States. And pretreatment was defined as giving a P2Y12 inhibitor prior to coronary angiography. And we used the NCDR chest pain MI registry in the United States. Uh, from January 2013 to March 2023, and look at patients who underwent early invasive strategy for non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. Early invasive strategy was defined as coronary angiography within the 24 hours of arrival, which is in accordance with the guidelines. And what we found is that first, the use of pretreatment has steadily declined from 24.8% in the first quarter of 2013 to 12.4% in the first quarter of 2023, uh, which is a 50% reduction. Uh, and there is a wide variability in practice of pretreatment between operators, institutions, and across the United States, all ranging from zero to 100%, which suggests that there's a strong prevalence for a selected treatment as a default strategy. And then lastly, in the contemporary era, involving over uh, 110,000 patients. When we look at the in-hospital outcomes, there's no difference in all-cause deaths, recurrent MI, or major bleeding. But among those who subsequently underwent cabbage, the hospital length of stay was significantly longer in those who received pretreatment, suggesting that there's a delay in cabbage while waiting for a washout of P2I12 inhibitor effect. Okay, uh, awesome. Thanks for your summary. Um, next, I'm curious about the background and motivation behind this work. What initially led you to pursue this particular study? What were the primary questions or concerns that inspired you to examine pretreatment of with P2I12 inhibitors in these populations? Yeah, so this discussion about whether to pretreat uh, patients presenting with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome uh, with P2I12 inhibitor has been the topic of debate for over a decade. Uh, you know, historically, giving a P2I12 inhibitor as soon as possible at the time of diagnosis prior to going to coronary angiography has been the preferred approach uh, due to its theoretical benefit in preventing uh, periperiesthesia ischemic events. However, there's been no randomized trials that directly show that benefit uh, of such practice. And in fact, more recent studies, including the COST trials and the dubious trial, as well as data from registry, have shown that there appears to be uh, no benefit from such approach and potential harm uh, in some studies, such as increased risk of bleeding. And we know that among those with uh, suspected non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome on presentation, only about 65% actually ends up getting PCI. So the remaining patients are exposed to harm uh, from mistreatment due to misdiagnosis and delayed cabbage. And reflecting these insights, the European guidelines made a drastic shift in 2020, now recommending against routine pretreatment with any of the P2I12 inhibitor for those undergoing early invasive strategy for non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, particularly when the coronary anatomy is unknown. But from my experience working at different hospitals in different countries, uh, I experienced myself that the practice varies. And there has been only a few literatures, but they suggest that the pretreatment is still being performed very frequently in some countries, but there has been no data about it in the United States. So we first wanted to understand what are we doing in the United States? What's the variability? What's the factor that is making physicians perform 
pretreatment and what is the consequent clinical outcomes related to this practice in the real world? Great. Um, so one of your key findings was a considerable variability in the pretreatment pre rates across operators, institutions, mostly in uh, across regions. I, I'd love to hear your perspective on this variation. What do you think contribute to these contribute to these differences and what implications might they hold for clinical practice? Yeah, so this was a very important and interesting finding. Um, when we looked into what factors are making physicians to perform pretreatment, of course, there were some patient level factors that understandably affected the choice of pretreatment. You know, patients who had history of PCI or cabbage, but those who uh, were admitted during the weekend, these patients were more likely to be pretreated. Whereas those with history of atrial fibrillation and therefore requiring anticoagulation or ESRD on dialysis patient that more that is more likely to bleed, these patients were less likely to be pretreated. However, even adjusting for these factors, the large variability persisted, which suggests that the biggest and the main driver for pretreatment was in fact, the operator themselves and the institution themselves. So it appears that it's really the personal preference and local culture that is driving the decision of pretreatment. And this probably reflects the different ways the physicians interpret and respond to newer evidence, you know, particularly as in the United States where local guidelines have not yet made a clear recommendation against pretreatment. Indeed, you know, uh, it's very interesting that, you know, the physicians is the major factor driving this variability in the clinical practice. And then there is no, you know, uh, standard protocol in the clinical guidelines uh, about this. And, and I believe this study has significant potential to support more uniform evidence-based practices. You know, it can be a powerful message to cardiologists who routinely perform pretreatment, showing that many others do not actually, and without, there is no apparent, apparent adverse impact on outcomes. Sometimes the best way to drive change is by showing, showing how practice is different, is different uh, between others. So from this perspective, uh, what impact do you anticipate this publication may have on cardiologists' decisions making and practice patterns? Yeah, I think you're right. You know, creating evidence uh, is one step, but implementing evidence into practice is the other step. And implementation science is difficult. You know, evidence has to be created, it has to be delivered, it has to be perceived credible, and it has to be disseminated. Uh, disseminated. And there, there's a step where we need to understand what are we doing now. And I think this paper sheds light on that aspect. Um, I think a lot of us have intuitively felt from experience that there's probably a variability in practice, and maybe some did not if they're practicing in the area where pretreatment is being routinely performed. But in either way, uh, being presented the actual national trend data is important to realize where you stand. And being shown on top of you know randomized trial reporting benefit no benefit of pretreatment in the controlled setting being shown that uh, the real world data at where you practice also reproduce the lack of benefit uh, can facilitate the change in practice and you know other in interesting finding uh, that I want to point out is that uh, when we looked at the trend in the rate of pretreatment uh, and its association with publication of relevant Negative, negative clinical trials and uh, updates in European guidelines now recommending against pretreatment. We found that there's no drastic shift change in pattern, but there is a tendency of a negative slope change after each of these events. And this suggests that there's a gradual dissemination of evidence that is changing physicians' practice, and we should main, maintain our effort in identifying the barriers and integrating evidence into clinical practice at the national level. And I don't think this is a message only for cardiologists. You know, pretreatment can be started by emergency physicians or hospitalists as well, who may not necessarily be most up to date on the topic, understandably so, as evidences keep on evolving. But I hope that this publication can reach to those physicians as well to uh, overall change of practice, practice nationally. So it's found that you know the publication of negative uh, results from the randomized controlled trial or the publication of the 
uh, European guidelines against the pretreatment of P2I12 inhibitors in these patients. Uh, these does not uh, did not impact on the clinical practice the shift in the clinical practice. And I hope your uh, publication actually affect physicians uh, inside and outside of cardiology field to change their practice. And finally, since your study focused on the U.S. data, so I'm curious about its potential influence on clinical practice beyond the U.S. How do you think these findings might be received internationally, and in particular, what impact could be they have in Japan? Yeah. So when we start thinking about this at a global level, I think there are a couple of important nuances related to like resources and management of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome that vary significantly across countries uh, that both influences the decision of pretreatment and the applicability of this study to their practice. You know, specifically factors such as like how long does it uh, take for a patient to get coronary angiography uh, when they present as like non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome or what are the predominant P2I12 inhibitor being used? Is intravenous P2I12 inhibitor being commonly used? And what are the availability or likelihood of su subsequently undergoing cabbage? And there aren't much data, but looking at the available literature, the rate of pretreatment uh, in the United States we found was relatively surprisingly low compared with some other countries. And this may be because we have relatively good access to the cath lab, and most patients can be brought to the cath lab within 24 hours. Just to clarify, the class three recommendation against routine pretreatment with P2I12 inhibitor for non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome is for this population undergoing early invasive strategy. And we don't really have a good data for patients who will take you know, three, four, five days to go to cath lab. And there's a still room for debate in such situation. And you know, additionally, in, in a place where potential for subsequently undergoing cabbage is vanishingly low, the disadvantage of pretreatment may be sought irrelevant. So I think all of these local resources and factors come into play uh, when thinking about practice globally. And in a healthcare system that is similar to the United States, I think they could potentially extrapolate our findings and I hope it can influence their practice. Um, specifically because you mentioned about Japan, Japan has a little bit of, of a unique background. One is that PCI is very, very prevalent and available in Japan, and it's tremendously aging society. So there is a much less likelihood of a patient presenting with non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome to subsequently undergo cabbage. That's one factor. And the other factor is that um, you know, vast majority of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome in Japan receives the Prasigrel, which is the P2I12 inhibitor Spe specifically studied in the COAST trial in 2013 and showed the lack of benefit and increased risk of bleeding with pretreatment in this population. So going back to like US and Europe, pretreatment with Prasigo is uh, has long been the class three recommendations and, and therefore rarely performed. But importantly, the dose of Prasigo in Japan is uniquely different. The loading dose and maintenance dose of Prasigo in Japan is approximately one third of what it is uh, done globally, which stems from the thought that this could decrease the risk of bleeding. So I think there's reasonable argument in Japan that the results of a COAST trial may not directly apply to the Japanese practice. And in fact, in Japan too, even with predominant use of Prasigal, there's wide variability and probably a tendency towards actually pretreating these patients. Um, but there's also similarity between US and Japan, such as like availability of cath lab and how fast patients are brought to the cath lab uh, in the setting of non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. So I hope that although it might not directly apply to the Japanese practice, that our study can become the basis of discussion to rethink about the practice in Japan as well. Yeah, um, so I've heard about that, you know, uh, the using a very low dose prostrol uh, is very common in Japan. So it's very different from Korea because in Korea, high color is more, more common, I think, than uh, using the prostrol. But I think uh, your study is very 
uh, uh, is really meaningful beyond U.S., especially in, you know, uh, those countries with in you know, a high accessibility to cath labs such as Japan or Korea. Okay, so thank thank you so much, Dr. Yuema, for sharing your insights with your with us today. This has been a valuable dis discussion, and uh, I appreciate your time and expertise. Arigatou gozaimasu, Yuema Sensei. I look forward to seeing your the impact of your important work. Thank you again, and take care. Thanks. Thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimasu.